Hi, I'm Dr. Gwen, and my channel is all about creating content that empowers the neurodiverse community. In this episode, Dr. Deborah Winking comes back on the show to share her last three habits that she promotes in her book to establish environments where neurodiverse kids can not only function, but also thrive. Welcome back to the show. Um, I am so lucky because Dr. Deborah Winking is back. Hi, Deb. Cheers. How are you? Cheers. Cheers to you. Um, Deb, how did I get so lucky to have you back for a fourth time? Uh because I'm like a bad penny and I just keep showing up, I guess. Oh my I gosh. Know. I mean, you're maybe you're the lucky penny, is is really what it is. Um, you know, I, I mean, Deb. If anyone has seen you before on, on the show, they know what you're about, right? But I will say, you know, for those of you that don't know Deb, she is a, a highly accomplished author, um, a wonderful mother, and um, a very, like, renaissance teacher. Because you've been, you, you're, like, in the classroom, and then you're, like, teaching college students, and then you're back in the classroom. So... I mean, just such varied and diverse kinds of experiences and expertise that, you know, you bring all together to share with us. So thank you for coming back. Thank you. I find that going back into the classroom keeps me fresh, keeps it real, and keeps me extremely, extremely um, humble. So yeah, I'm really excited yeah. to be going back and teaching next year. Yeah. And, you know, um, so, Deb, you're back because your beautiful book, we have been reviewing the habits in that book. And we have come to the last habits here in this in this episode that we're taping today. So with without further ado, I'm just going to let you go. Like you do okay. your thing, girl. <laughs> let's do it. And let's dish these last three habits. I am going to um, sit back, hopefully a little more this time. And, and I just want you to weigh in because uh, you have so much to share. And I'm actually refining this content as I spend time with experts like you as well. So let's do this. Oh, okay. Awesome. So you've got the wheel, Deb. <laughs> you've got the got wheel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hope I won't take us off a cliff. Let's see. All right. You know, just because it's been a, it's been a minute, um, I'm going to yeah. just pop through these and then we're going to land on those three, but I'm not going to say anything about them just to give a little, but just put them out there to give a little context. So first we started with the foundation uh, capable parents believe that effort creates ability and potential. Secondly, capable parents listen to their child and lean into those natural curiosities. Thirdly, uh, capable parents, set a vision of capable, what that looks like with their child and adjust it over time. Capable parents put that diagnosis in its place and remember that their child has a lot more in common with other kids than they do a set of characteristics. Capable parents name their fears and use that vision of capable to help tame those fears. Capable parents use words and act mm. in ways that send their kid the message that they think that they are capable. Capable parents set the expectation that others will treat their child as capable as well. Capable parents cha challenge their child in safe ways that take them and themselves a little beyond their comfort zone. Capable parents walk alongside professionals to get their child the support and services they need. And drum roll, we're at our last three. Capable parents allow their child to make choices and experience the consequences of those choices. Capable parents celebrate their child's persistence and build a narrative of strength. And mm. capable parents treat themselves with compassion, make mistakes, laugh and learn from them. So those last three are the ones we're going to get at today. Let's go. Love it. All right. Um, 
allow your child to make those choices and experience con experience the consequences. So there's a lot in this one. Um, and let's do this as a dialogue, um, Gwen. But basically, if we think about it, making choices and experiences the consequences of our choices is what gives each of us agency and makes us all fully human. And I get very concerned when that process is cut short for our kids with disabilities or those who are neurodiverse. So let's take both of those halves, both halves of that equation, making the choices, experiencing the consequences. Um, let's take each of those separately, okay? Um, so I think it's really interesting and you have a typically a child who identifies as neurotypical. I have mm, at least two of my four do. And I would say that it's pretty universally true that our typically developing kids um, receive increasing responsibility over the course of their childhood. They get a chance to, to flex their choice-making muscles from when they're really little, let's say, oh, first we just give them one color of Play-Doh. Then we move on and say, hey, you know what? You can handle multiple colors at the same time without mixing them all up. Um, we allow kids to choose their extracurriculars. They, we allow ki our kids to choose what their look is in high school. I had a couple of kids who wanted to go goth. Um, we um, give our kids choices about how they want to earn extra cash. You know, do they want to do fast food? Do they want to do landscaping? Do they want to do dog sitting? Um, they, we give our kids choices around what kind of courses they want to take. Like, oh, I want to take regular courses or honors courses or AP. Um, and every time we increase, every time we do that from those balls of Play-Doh when they were three um, to choosing high school courses, um, we give them a chance to flex their muscles at weighing options, comparing alternatives, reconciling the kind of trade-offs that come with making decisions and feeling the consequences of those choices that they freely made. And that cycle uh, of developing agency, I think it cut short um, for our kids. And what I've noticed and push back on me, but the greater the perceived disability, the more that choice making is cut short for kids is what I see. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if you want to jump in here, but it's a real concern of mine. Yeah, I love this. Um, I love this, Deb, in so many ways because, and I think this is very much connected to another one of your habits or mindsets, which is, you know, actions, your actions actually speak louder than your words. So when you don't allow or you supersede or you overrule, um, these choices or you control the message that that action sends is that the child is not capable of making their own decisions. And I think, you know, when we don't have practice making decisions, we're not involved in solving our problems. Then we're not involved in analyzing our problems. We're not involved in, in, um, you know, all the nuances that come that we could never anticipate or predict. And you know, you know that you're right. That, that takes us right back to I, habit seven and learned helplessness. And so, yeah. I, you know, what you just said, I have a real, I think, a great example from the second book that's not out yet. But um, girl I worked with, Chloe, we saw this so well. I went in the classroom and, and was able to see it. The aide that she worked with knew her so well, and she was dick. She was in a high school inclusive um, English language arts class. The teacher read, or the instructional aide read the prompt to her. The prompt was um, describe your favorite game and tell someone else how to play it. While Chloe was still processing and kind of trying to come up with her choice of what her favorite game was. Aid said, oh, oh, this is an easy one, Chloe. You love playing. You love playing Uno. Put Uno. App. And the less and the and the that was put down as her answer. 
She went from there. Afterwards, I talked to Chloe. She said, I like so many games. I really like playing Jenga with my brother. But Miss Simone said Uno, so I put Uno. I mean, that is an example of how choice making gets cut short. And I think mm -hmm. it happens because maybe some of our kids haven't been reliable choosers in the past or take a little longer to choose. And that's when we start shortcutting that process because we want to get things done, right? And, yeah. and I, also, I also want to say, too, a word about safe choices. Of course, you know, now I, I'm not saying we cut kids loose to make every choice in their lives. I mean, if we've got kids who can't judge the speed of an ongoing car or uh, the meaning of traffic signals, we're not going to let them make the choice of when to cross the street. But we need to find those safe choices for our kids to make and give them plenty of time to flex those muscles. So when you don't have any choice, um, you have a different relationship to the consequences. For example, I didn't like that ice cream flavor, that movie, those shoes, that activity, but they were imposed upon me through no action of mine. Next time I might assert my will and topple that ice cream cone when it's put in my face. I might, um, uh, I might turn away from that movie. I might flop when I'm asked to go into that activity. Those are great acts of volition. And I actually applaud kids when they do that, but that's not making us better choosers in the future, that, that child better choosers in the future. Um, on the other hand, if we take that little bit of extra time have that child choose and feel the consequences. Ooh, I feel in that salty taste of the salted caramel ice cream I got and it feels bad in my mouth. And, or I had a bad dream because I chose the scary movie or blisters on my feet because I chose to wear the high heels. Um, or I ended up sitting on the bench because I chose an activity that wasn't very fun. Those experiences begin, to, and we talked about this the last time we were together, begin to etch new neural pathways in that child's brain. And the next time they're going to flex those decision-making muscles differently. And that's the process of building agency. So, yeah. And because inevitably that experience is, is a formal way of understanding who I am. Right. It's a way to define my self-awareness and who I am and what I like or not like. And sometimes those things are so abstract that I actually have to experience them in order to know. You know, and I, I see the the other the other population that gets really kind of um superseded here are my non-speakers, right? Oh. Because for some reason we've got this idea that, you know, verbal language is the only signal of intelligence. So a lot of times my non-speakers or my unreliable communicators um, are also kind of um, over overridden. I, I don't know if that's right, but yes. you know, we just we just don't believe or presume that they're competent to make choices. And so that's just another area. So you know, even if it's not more, you know, sometimes. Uh, more time is nice. You said that, Deb, right? Like more processing time. In addition, did we provide ample opportunity for communication to occur? Because sometimes we need to get really creative with communication. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, sometimes if we, they don't have a way to communicate. I mean, that's on us, I think. Oh yeah. That's 100% on us. I have just been working with the, uh, just a couple of examples, a little girl who's using eye gaze to communicate, mm -hmm. to put her voice into the world. Um, you know, all the different ways kids are communicating with assistive commu uh, uh, communication devices and PECs. Um, and interestingly, how we, I think you made the point in the beginning, how we prize verbal, using our mouth, verbal communication as, you know, the privileged uh, the privileged form of communication and others are somehow less valid. And I think we also have to get, get away from that because yeah. like you said, being very creative on how we, how we help all of everyone, every human put their voice into the world. And yep. I think that's, I think that's key. Um, now, if we can, if we go to the other end of that, kind of that agency um, equation, make choices, take the time, give folks 
the opportunity to make choices so they can show us their uniqueness. The other side is the consequences. And I just want to say a little bit about consequences. And I also uh, want to kind of want to chew on this one a little. Consequences come, We sometimes we always we think of consequences as a bad thing. Well, consequences aren't bad. They come in multiple flavors, you know, good, bad, and just mess. Sometimes you do something and you get a good thing happens. Sometimes a bad thing happens and sometimes no, nothing much happens at all. And secondly, there's also two types of, two big types of, of, of consequences. And those are natural and imposed consequences. And I guess I want to get into this and talk about, talk about the work of a couple of really stellar researchers in this area. But the idea is what we're learning and what hopefully everybody's hearing is that one type of one type of consequence and one one type of consequence and that is time out is um been proven as extremely ineffective and harm harmful and that kids don't need time out they need time it ends i'm not going to take a a lot of their time on this now but i want to talk about uh, one of the most overused imposed consequences, um, and that is removing toys or privileges. How often do we see toys or privileges removed? And I guess I want to get into like peaceful discipline and, and the explosive child. That's Ross Green, explosive child, and the work of Sarah Moore and many others in peaceful discipline. And they point out their their bias is is that removing privileges should never be used uh, because all the children will ever get from that is the idea that me as a parent me as a big person can impose pain on you by taking away something that you love or enjoy and i um i guess i i guess i want to go dig a little deeper into that, um, get into some of the nuance, because I want to say, I think the important question is the child learning to make a better choice. And here, I think the pivot point is intention. So for example, um, let's do, do an example. I'll do an example with the natural consequence and with two different types of imposed consequences and see what you think. So your kid, the, the child is sitting um, on his Xbox and you get a call from the teacher saying he's going to fail math if he doesn't turn his paper in. Okay, the natural consequence is stays on the Xbox, he fails math, and he takes it again next year. The problem with the natural consequence is natural consequences, while they're the best, they only work if the natural consequence really comes through and if the person cares about the natural consequence. So let's say he doesn't do it, he stays, stays on the Xbox all night, and uh, the school's decided that they've got too many failing grades, and they say, ah, eh, we'll just make that a D minus and forget about it. You know, then there was actually no, con the, the imposed consequence never happened. I mean, I'm sorry, the natural consequence never happened. Um, or if the child doesn't care about the consequence, oh, so I flunked it. I'll be there next year. And I'll do the same thing. That's when our natural consequences don't work as well. Now let's get at the imposed. So I think the point is intent. So um, here's how I would uh, how I would play out a natural uh, imposed consequence that has a shaming intent. So. I just heard from the teacher that you're gonna fail math if you don't turn this paper in. I'm taking your Xbox because you're flunking math. That's shaming, right? That is shaming that child and that should never be done. What if on the other hand, you offer a, an, what would be called an imposed con consequence, but with encouraging intent. You know what? Your behavior, your math grade, is telling me that you need a little more time to focus on math. What do you think? I know with more time you can do it, so we're going to set this Xbox aside for an hour tonight. Now, I would say there that assuming that all the child will get from that 
is that the parent is causing them pain by taking that Xbox, by him not having that Xbox for an hour, assumes, kind of sells our kids short and assumes that our children can't detect difference in intention, tone, or that they can't reflect later and say, wow, I did get that assignment done. Maybe it was good to lay off the Xbox for an hour. So that's where I kind of, I kind of parse out that consequences because I don't think it's just always the natural. I think, I think a imposed consequence can be delivered um, with an encouraging intent. And I think that it can result in our kids learning to make better choices, not just thinking we're big meanies. So I'm going to stop here and let you weigh in and then we'll, we can keep going. I mean, I think the, you know, how, what kind of feedback we give to our kids mm -hmm. really comes a lot of times um, from a parent's own, and this is connected to your, some of your other habits, Deb, the yes. fear and worry of that parent. Yes. You know, if I'm yeah. if I'm fearful as a parent that my kid's not going to graduate or, you know, there's some bigger, bigger consequences down down the road, yes. then I'm very motivated to lean in and take control of the situation. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, um, kind of going back to that idea of collaboration, because if we collaborate and cooperate with our kids, no matter what age they are, there is the implication and the feel that their kids are capable to be involved in a decision that involves themselves, um, you know, it's to it, even, you know, another strategy I think is, is to even go to that kiddo and say, oh my gosh, I just got a call from your teacher and I'm freaking out as your mom. Yes. <laughs> uh, right. It's me. I'm freaking out. It, and here's what I'm really, really worried about. What do you think about that? And, and I need your help in this because I don't really know how to manage my own anxiety surrounding this because I really don't want you to fail. I really want you to get your diploma. I really, right. And even, it, you know, even if the end goal is still, okay, okay, mom, like, fine, I'm, I'll put aside the Xbox for an right. hour and I'll do it for you. At least the information, at least the, the worry is coming from this kind of authentic, genuine place, which is, the worry is being driven by the parents' worry and fears. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that can even be the intermediary because, you know, sometimes parents are so fearful that they can't see beyond that. They can't see this is an opportunity to promote the agency of my kid. You know what I mean? And so yes, I absolutely. find like that dialogue can also result in agency um, and cooperation for both so that um, – you know, there at least the, at least the positive. There's some positive messaging that still comes through in that situation. Um, yeah, and I think man, kids, I yeah, think our kids can hear that. I think yeah, they for can sure. Hear. I'm really. I mean, you know, the, the, what the scenario I just offered could start could could go the same way. Could be, hey, I just talked to your teacher. Looks like you need more time on math. I'm really worried. What are we yeah. gonna do? You can, yeah. He can hear that, and I think it's okay for the teacher, for, for a parent to say, I am so worried that, you know, I feel like there's got to be some time where you're working on this tonight. When could that yeah. happen? You can give them yep. part, part in the choice, but, but what, I, what I'm not, where I depart is that, is that any loss of privilege results in kids thinking, their parents are pain inflictors. I don't know that. I think if you frame it the way you just did or some version of how I just did, I don't know. I believe that many kids wouldn't see that as just, oh, my, my parent is just a mean pain inflictor. Because no. you shared yeah. it, as you've just said, because you've shared it as, hey, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about your grade. It looks like, it looks like you know, from, from what I'm seeing is you need, you're going to need some more time to, to get this in. You know, that is a different. And we talk about how our kids hear our tone well yeah. before they hear anything else. So so I guess that's where I feel, because I think yeah. people are sometimes hearing this message. Any loss of privilege is bad. 
And I don't know, I, I still think it turns on the intention, how we frame it, and maybe as you're saying, add as you're saying, how we involve the child in talking about our anxiety about it. So, yeah. Um, so, and, um, and I guess the other thing that I think is really, really important is um, to talk about how I have seen an in a pattern of inconsistent consequences for children with and without disabilities result in just a world of pain in families. And so I think it's worthwhile to talk about what happens when, you know, you have multiple kids and what they see, what siblings see is, oh, there's results for me, but there's not any consequences for my sibling with a um, with some kind of challenge or neurodiversity. And I think that I, I've talked to scads of families where that's just torn up a family. And I think um, the fact is, is that kids can understand differences in rules and consequences. They can understand and be empathetic and be a champion for a brother or sister who's different. But what they can understand is what looks like no consequences, no results, no rules for one person in the family and rules for another. And um, so, for example, um, kids can understand if I don't do my chores, you know, I, I don't have time for TV. But and if my brother, let's say, who has some severe behaviors, if my brother throws things at the wall when he is frustrated, he, he has to help mom clean it up. Those are two different consequences, it's not the same consequence. Kids can understand different consequences. What they can't understand is when it appears to them that there is no um, rules for their brother or sister who may have um, some kind of a neuro, neuro, uh, some kind of neurodiversity or a difference. Um, and I think you talked about fear before. That's where it often comes in. All a lot of the time, what happens is we're so we're so fearful. We feel bad for our kid um, who has challenges. Oh, he's got enough challenges. I'm not going to to um, you know, I, it keeps us from being consistent because we feel so bad for our child or keeps us from being consistent because we believe if we, um, if we keep to, uh, our consequences, what will happen is, um, it'll be too painful, you know? So I think one of the things that's important is, is whatever you decide to do, um, and we talked about intentionality and tone and compassion, but that you're consistent with your kids because when you're not, those kids with and without, um, uh, wherever they are on the spectrum of neurodiversity, um, um, you know, can understand that. But what they can't understand was is when it seems like their brother or sister. Um, sort of is running roughshod or manipulating people in the house. What do you think about that? I, I think that the conversation of equity versus equality is different and is necessary Absolutely. in families. So, um, and, and those are dialogues to be had and that we need to believe that everyone in a family is capable of understanding the differences and the nuances mm -hmm. um, of the difference between equity and equality. So, okay. you know, necessary for conversation for sure. Yeah, and 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 just recognizing um, that, you know, our kids want to make sense. They want to love, they want to love, they want to be loving in their families, but but I have seen situations where certain where a kid with it uh, with whatever their challenge is is has become very manipulative in their family because there's a lack because there's a lack of of making sense with that child of, of their behavior whether and I'm not talking about just issues of 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 us not providing kids with a um, a form of communication we we kids need to see that hey not fair you're right. There's a big difference between equity and equality, but that um, it doesn't, it, 
they are not, um, their needs are not being set aside um, because of concern or fear for um, their mm -hmm. brother or sister who may have um, more or appears to have more challenges than them. Yeah, for sure. So, so number 11, habit 11, we're already down near the end. Um, celebrate your child's persistence to build a narrative of strength. And um, I think this one is so near and dear to my heart um, because we know that whether we like it or not, we live in this reductive society and oftentimes um, messages we get from our environment are kind of shuttled into a tally. Oh, that was good. That was bad. That was good. That was bad. And that's not the right way to look at them. But I, but what happens is, is when you're a kid who maybe get, doesn't get as many positive messages from their environment as other kids, they tend to get sorted out that way. So I'll give you an example. Um, here's an example from the first book with my kid. Jack had always struggled with self-esteem, and I believe this internal tally sheet was a large, in large part responsible for anger issues that I saw incubating. When you speak and the kid next to you predictably rolls her eyes because she doesn't like how you look, it's logged as loss. When kids talk over you as if you're not there because there are too many ums in your delivery, loss. When kids walk away as you're telling your, a story because it just plain takes too long for you to get it out, loss. When you run out of steam during PE class, loss. When you whip the ball and kick it in the air during the kickball game and every, as everyone watches, loss. When the point you make repeats what another kid has just said because of the extra processing time it takes you to get your thoughts out, loss. When the classmate reading your paper says she can't read it because your handwriting is too babyish, loss. When you shoot 500 three free, free throws on your driveway only to sit on the bench the entire game as your teammates fly down the court, oblivious to your presence, loss. When kids are talking about the party that everyone is invited to but you, loss. When kids are egging you on to drink, to drink the hot sauce because they know you don't have the confidence or social capital say no, loss. So those are how things kind of can get logged into kids' psyches with this old kind of old paradigm tally. And the fact is um, research shows that heard 10,000 more negative comments than their peers without ADHD. So um, I, parents have a real role in mediating um, the, the information that comes to their kids through their environment by focusing on their persistence. I love how you ha hung in there. I love how you stuck with it. I love how you really showed up and showed kids who you were. I love how you took all that time to get this done. Those kinds of things allow our kids to reframe um, their experiences and their challenges as um, acts of strength. And um, I wanna talk about building a narrative of strength because what, what science tells us is around adolescence, we start become becoming historians of ourselves and we start thinking um, thinking about our story, the story of our life. And if we can work with our kids to help them develop a narrative of strength, telling themselves a, a story of strength about how they um, came to school the next day, even though someone said something unkind or whatever it is, um, we're, we're, we're helping them develop that all important narrative of strength that helps them see themselves as, you know, as a superhero, as a, as a, um, as the protagonist of their own life rather than as a, a victim. 
So um, that's why I think what happens with us as parents is we don't realize how often we talk about getting it done right or wrong rather than talking about effort. And I think it happens all the time. It ha I mean, test scores themselves are just a palpable example of right, wrong, as opposed to talking about process, talking about persistence, um, talking about what, um, what happens when we hang in there. So I'm gonna pause there, but I think what I encourage the parents in my uh, capable parent communities to do is to spend time listening to the ways they talk about their child's struggles, attempts, false starts, and really check themselves to see if they're um, building a narrative of strength or um, prioritizing having it done right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's beautiful. And I think there's, you know, such lovely, you know, research and um, thoughts and frameworks surrounding this, you know, whether it's, you know, Carol Dweck's growth mindset or Angela Duckworth's yeah. grittiness or, right, like this idea yeah. of, you know, praising effort versus outcome mm -hmm. is a, a much needed kind of uh, focus, you know, today for sure. And it's, it's lovely. And, you know, and I think when you praise effort, it's not just lip service because when we praise kids for outcomes that they may or may not have been invested in, or they may have, may not have been connected to, it doesn't go anywhere. Right. So right. this is, yeah, this is great. I love it. Well, and the thing is, is, is absolutely, um, you know, I, I pull from Carol Duckworth and Angela, um, but um, Carol Dweck and Angela Duckworth, I pulled from their work, but I think it's looking at it from the other lens. It's what are we as parents doing? We can know it's important to persist, but still on our end, not realizing that we're falling into old patterns of, of you know, you didn't, you didn't, uh, you didn't sweep the floor right. I'm gonna do it for you again. You know, I'm going to do it over yeah. for you. I mean, I, I've talked to parents who, um, well, if particularly um, the more um, involved our kids' neuro, um, neuro challenges become. I've worked in places and rooms and with parents and teachers who are lifting the cup to kids' mouths because they don't want, uh, you know, it wouldn't be right if, you know, if, if uh, the juice would dribble on the ground. It wouldn't be right if um, I let I let them put the toothpaste on their toothbrush themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And those are other kinds of examples yeah. of, of, of focusing on right and wrong as opposed yep. to effort. Yeah, and process, love it. Absolutely. Um, okay, hey, we are at the end, folks. Um, love it, Deb. So uh, treat, uh, last one is treat yourself with compassion, make mistakes, laugh and learn from them. Um, and you know, the key question here is how, what can I do for myself so I can show up for my child? So, um, we took it in the other order through this podcast, but when I, when I do, uh, presentations and keynotes, I go through the 12, um, mindsets of parents who raise their child to be capable. And I start with 12, I start with the end in mind. And because number 12 really allows us to to let the other 11, to allow the other 11 to soak in. In other words, if we are able to treat ourselves with compassion, if we come, if we show up to parenting, um, recognizing that we will make mistakes, that we can laugh and learn from them, then we can internalize the other 11. So it's almost like I go through that list, then we start with 12 and then we go back to one. Yeah. Um, and just to, Put a bow on this. Um, so some of the things we get into here, and you know, look, I didn't, I didn't set out to, didn't want to, and have not created a uh, exhaustive self care handbook. This is not what Habit Twelve is about. But I do offer some. We talk through some 
strategies that are particularly important for parents whose um, kid may be neurodiverse or have a disability. So with that focus in mind, we talk about getting vulnerable, recognizing that we're making mistakes. We pull from the Brene Brown work, but we talk about you know how, how that plays out when our kid um, is neurodiverse and has a disability. We talk about the fact that our kids are very, very intuitive. Nobody's more intuitive than our children who are neuro, uh, neurodiverse or have disabilities and how they need to see that we are okay showing that we make mistakes and that we recover from them. We talk about letting go of shoulds and that is a really um, fun piece where we talk about, you know, all those imaginings, all those, um, those ideas of what parenting should look like that we've brought down from our parents and their parents before them and letting go of those should saying and, um, and christening new experiences that we have that are our real parenting and that those are what parenting is and celebrating those instead of those shoulds like, oh, you know, my, sh my child should be showering himself and jumping on the bus ready to go to school. My child should be doing this. I should be able to sit with a cool glass of wine while my child does his homework quietly in the next room. Letting go of those type of shoulds and um, developing your own beautiful conception of what your real parenting life is like and celebrating that. Um, saying bye bye to shame. We talk about people and situations that are shame inducing and how we let go of them. Uh, we're going back to uh, Carol Dweck and Angela Duckworth's work. We, we, we learn to recognize where, we, where we've decided that whatever our kids' drama or trauma today is, it's going to be there forever. And that happens a lot with our kids um, who have challenges it may feel like we're in it forever. I'm going to be in a situation forever where my child is, is hurting my, hurting themselves by um, hitting their head so hard. I mean, those things are actually painful and how to recognize that whatever, whatever our challenge is today, it will not be forever. Um, we talk about outing, outing ourselves, not suffering in silence. Um, how, how connecting with other parents, including parents whose kids are neurotypical, um, allows you to find commonalities that you didn't know existed and brings you into more community with even parents who you thought you had nothing in, in common with. Um, and then uh, finding and literally um, christening our own form of self-care it doesn't have to be what everyone else wants, but committing to that. And then um, also identifying reliable helpers that recognizing that we cannot, should not, and can and should never be everything for our child. Finding other people, maybe it's Uncle Johnny or somebody down the street that talks with our child about this or goes with our child to the library or does whatever because we often have such resistance in asking for help. Um, so those are just some of the examples of things we get at with um, habit 12. And that is um, treating ourselves with compassion and being able to laugh and learn from our mistakes. So that is that. Amen. That is the habits um, in a four part nutshell, shall we say? Yeah, I love it. I love it, Deb. No, that's fantastic. That is, thank you so much, Deb, for coming. You know, I think your habits and your mindsets, they're really wonderful um, ways to think about being and acting. Um, and, you know, whenever we can think about things from a systems perspective, it doesn't make every single decision so difficult. Right. Because if we have a system of thinking about, wow, I overall believe that my kiddo is competent then cooperation and compassion and choices automatically flow, you know, from oh, directly from there, from, from that. that. Right. Exactly. Right. Right. So it's just invaluable. That, yeah. We've not studied that. If we don't, yeah. we're not intentional about that. We can get shot around like a ping pong, uh, like a, yeah. a, 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 in a pinball machine, a, a pinball machine ball, because so much stuff comes at us 
when we're parenting yeah. a child for the, where the world somehow has slapped a label on that child. So I'm, I'm hoping that this work um, helps parents with that intentionality and also, um, you know, lets them look at the lighter side of parenting as well, um, because now they have, as you said, a system. Yeah. And dare, dare we even say find joy? Yes, in the parenting. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, 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 how, like maybe we, you know, go out there on a limb. Um, Hey Deb, really quick, where can people, okay. So let's, let's re let's tell the audience again, the full title of your book and where they can find it. So go ahead and do that. Okay. The first book is capable, a story of tri triumph for children. The world has judged as different. That is my, is a memoir and people talk about fun and joy and laughing. People find that fun because I'm very self-deprecating and I make a lot of mistakes. The next, and they can find that on Amazon, in independent bookshops, and in some libraries. You can request it. Um, Capable, a story of triumph for children the world is judged as different in your public library and they'll get it for you. The new book, which should be out next year, um, is has a working title of Raising Capable Kids Regardless of the Challenges They Face. And that's the one that focuses on um, the habits, the research behind those habits um, and research that I'm continuing to conduct around that. That is not out yet. It'll come out through Jessica Kingsley Publishing and it will be, um, I hope, everywhere. Awesome. And we, how lucky are we? We got like a sneak peek of the, we, we like basically got the in-between of both of your books, right? Um, but really a sneak peek, which is so lovely. And, you know, Deb, thank you so much for coming on, for your enthusiasm, for your passion, for your excitement, um, for this community. It's evident and palpable, and we are lucky to have you in it. So I will put how to get a hold of you are interested in getting a hold of Deb, finding out more about her. I will have all of her information in the description below or the show notes. Um, and you can find her. Hopefully, Deb will, Deb, will you come back on when your book is published? Your next one? Oh, I would not miss it. I love and learn from you every time we're together. Hey, Gwen, can I make one last yeah. plug for yeah, participation sure. in ongoing research? So yeah, go ahead. What, what happened when it became clear to me that there were some things that parents sh shared in common. Wherever their kid was on that spectrum of neurodiversity, um, I started um, on a line of research. And Gwen may be so kind to put in the show notes a link to two surveys. One is for parents, if you identify mostly as a parent. One is if you identify mostly as a pr practitioner. They take five minutes to fill out and you will truly be helping others walking in your shoes if you do. And to me, that's the most compelling reason to spend five minutes on a survey because we're really trying to understand what these mindsets and habits are when we are raising our child as capable. So if you can click on there and respond to that survey, um, you'll be helping with this work. Yeah, no problem. I'll put it in the show notes in the description for sure. For sure. Deb, thanks so much. It's always a pleasure. We're going to have to make another excuse to get together. Let's it's it. going to be too long. <laughs> I know. You're going to have to write another book in between. That's all. I'll work on <laughs> Hey, Deb, great. maybe. Thank you. Yeah, uh, but, Deb, maybe what, what we might consider is you're going back into a classroom. Right. And so maybe what we can do is is maybe talk about some classroom strategies. Um, that could be its own thing. And I know that that would be really helpful for uh, many of our audience members. So I don't I know. Have a think about that, that. Because I've been on both sides. I sat on both mm -hmm. sides of the desk and I am not protective of educators um, and I am not protective of parents. I care my 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 in, intent starts with the child. And so we can look at both of those and talk about, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly without. Um, without condemning anyone. So that would be fair. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and we shouldn't because, you know, shame, shame is not good for anybody. So um, we'll just get on and, and talk about that. But thanks, Deb, again. Thank you. I appreciate your generosity of talent and time. Just so much, much appreciation to you. I appreciate you too, Gwen. Thank you so much. <laughs> Have a great night.
拜拜。